Hey everyone, Kirk Miller here, again from AEM Electronics, and we're back on the Pinsgar project. So, yeah, we missed our mark. We missed the date. I had committed to saying we should be rolling by Thanksgiving uh, for a multitude of reasons and excuses. Uh, we missed that mark. But we have made a lot of progress. We've had the team down here. We had the sales, marketing, and tech support team down working with where we're gonna put all the devices like we touched on in our last video. And uh, you'll see them around working with me and, and, uh, and the rest of the crew, fitting up devices, making sure we have clearance for them. And uh, I think we have it all sorted out. So I'm pretty excited to, again, now walk you through the next step. I'm gonna show you some of the actual products that we do have finally in-house, and then how we're gonna convert this to an EV. The cool thing here is we have so much in process right now, so much movement. It's only gonna be a few weeks before you see our next video with products actually being mounted and fitted. So I'm gonna walk you through the big components right now. What I wanna talk about today is the major devices and components that we'll be fitting up to the Pins Gallery. The biggest challenge was the battery pack. Got that sorted. The motor, got that sorted. The inverter, got that sorted. DC to DC. Got that sorted. Battery management system, of course, we've got that sorted with our system now, the BMS, and then the onboard charger system. So we've got all these devices that we're talking about right now and where we're gonna fit them up. And I'm really pleased to say that we came up with some really awesome solutions and a couple of surprises that make this a little bit easier to move forward. Like I said in the earlier video that we weren't gonna use CAD, we weren't gonna cheat, but actually we did. But in this case, it was actually cardboard aided design. That's our, our version of CAD. And uh, right here I have the motor, and you can see some of the exacting details for the center shaft and the output to give us a reference and size of, for the location of this and where it'll get fitted up. To my left, there's other devices. We have the gen set, the D -D DC to DC on board, the breaker box, um, and then over off to the right where we'll be walking, uh, we've got our, our actual motor, our actual inverter, and then a PM100 footprint for an inverter. This is something that gets used all the time in shops. And as I mentioned, we're doing this, the sales, marketing, and tech team are doing this. We do have engineering oversight, but we're doing it with toolbox tools, no special aided, aided tools. And we're using mock-ups, which is a common practice in virtually all forms of motorsport or conversion. So kidding aside, this is a great tool. And uh, you'll see when we walk over to the motor, you know, just how close this is in size. So it does give us a really good idea if this is gonna fit perfectly. So this isn't a 13B with no manifolding. This is an IM225 from Cascadia. This is a brand new motor package that they just released. We're blessed, honored, I don't know what you say, but we were one of the first to receive one of these. And that you can see by the packaging how small it is, which is incredible. Um, and then the PM100 that we were gonna be using, that's the footprint. So it's oversized to accommodate for the cooling lines and the high voltage lines. So that was actually the footprint it was gonna take. And the inverter that actually comes with it is incredibly dense, incredibly small. So really impressive, Cascadia, thank you. It is a very, very impressive package and there's a lot more details to follow. Before I go any further, I know you saw something rolling behind me. This is the good stuff. So this is the, the, a Mustang I mentioned in one of the other videos and it's got a Tesla conversion. They were just out testing out in our lot and out on the roads with our new Tesla drive board. So what you saw behind me was a vehicle in motion with our Tesla drive train, our Tesla drive board, and our VCU 200 in control. So that's, uh, I couldn't let it slide. I caught it out of my peripheral and I just wanted to share that with you. Back to the package. The original motor, I said it was 96 horsepower. It's actually 92 and about 133 foot pounds of torque. That was the 2.5 liter air-cooled four-cylinder that came in the Pinsgar originally. This guy at 350 volts, it's around 240 horsepower, and it's up around 365 foot-pounds of torque. So a substantial gain in power. Um, and we're gonna need it, because I'm gonna talk about some of the weight we're gonna be adding. We're, we're shedding a bunch of weight with the, with the engine that came out. That was about 580 pounds. This package right here is about 140 pounds, this motor inverter package. So it's, it's substantially lighter than what came out, but the battery packs, we're gonna exceed what we took out of the vehicle with the, the engine and transmission because we want a big battery with some decent range. You know, we're, we're talking about these substantial power increases with this motor uh, and inverter package. Here we go again with the VCU. So while we're not worried about blowing the tires off this thing like some of the other projects we're building because of the massive horsepower and torque, we are concerned about the drivetrain. You know, can it handle this massive increase in torque right out of the gate? So with the VCU, we can do different levels of performance. So that means different power outputs. And what's also really awesome is that we can program in a torque curve or a power curve 
uh, via the pedal position. So that means that if you're just rolling out, you don't have to worry about hitting the drivetrain really hard with all this torque and all this power, and possibly, in this old beast, breaking something in the drivetrain, which we do not want to do. So the advantage of the VCU begins to shine here a little bit. We're going to talk about where we mounted this. I, I, I alluded to in the first video where we, we planned on mounting this, but we actually sorted it out. So we're going to be using a, a step-down transmission from Torque Trends. What it allows us to do is actually mount the, the motor and transmission and parking paw mechanism right alongside the torque tube like we originally planned. So you're going to see some of the roll from the guys uh, where we're fitting up all these devices, which actually allowed us to confirm where we can fit all this, from our original concepts to now actual reality of fitting up devices. So I'm going to put it up and show you some of the other parts. Come with me over this way. One, one of the cool features here with the Torque Trends transmission is there's a parking pole mechanism available. Again, that'll be controlled with our VCU. When you put it on park on our keypad, it'll actually engage the paw. One of the challenges with a vehicle like this is because it has a high and low range, in the transfer case, if you are between high and low, you're actually neutral, so you're releasing the drivetrain from the parking paw. So what we have there, we're fortunate, is that the Pinsgauer actually comes with a parking brake sprag at the rear that actually locks the drivetrain. This lever right here with just really, really light pressure locks up the drivetrain. So we actually have two layers of park in a big beast like this which is something, again, you know, safety first, safety first, safety first. Something like that makes parking this thing and leaving on a hill or something like that, you know, uh, something that you're not actually thinking about. There's a lot of options for uh, emergency brakes done or parking brakes done through a disc brake conversion. That really wasn't an option in this case. If you look at these hubs, they're drop hubs, it would be a nightmare trying to sort that out. So we're going with the OG parking plus a high-tech parking paw that is part of the torque trends controlled by the VCU and our keypad. Okay, so the next we're gonna to touch on the battery. Uh, that was a big debate, you know, belly pans, side pans, you know, try to figure out where we can fit this thing. And we kept coming back to the floor pan area of the transporter section. It's a little over 32 inches wide, it's about 84 inches deep, and lo and behold, when we we're mocking up our Tesla battery packs, just half of the pack actually fits those dimensions almost perfectly. We're gonna stack the pack in the transporter area. I know it's gonna raise the center of gravity just slightly, um, but this exercise really is just to show the overall flexibility of our system. Uh, and as mentioned, we're, we have our, our genset integrated, and then we have our BMS integrated. So with the BMS and the genset, as mentioned, we can actually have the VCU looking at everything, watching everything, watch the state of charge, and if it falls below a certain threshold, the genset can actually kick on. Again, range extender. A little bit of the range anxiety that I tend to deal with, doesn't seem like anyone else has this problem, uh, will be off the table, so that's cool. So let's walk over to the battery pack itself. This is a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack. With a battery pack of this size, it's, a, it's like a big fuel tank. So we're gonna have some really nice range with this just on the batteries, so that's great. What's also great is the work that Tesla's done for thermal management and then the structural integrity of the pan itself. This is actually part of the chassis. And you'll see in some of the other shots we have, this is incredibly engineered. The thermal management, amazing. Everything's here, so why would we disrupt that? We're not going to. Fortunate for us, two pack wide will actually fit in the floor pan as mentioned, and then we're gonna take the other two, bring it up on top and stack it. There'll be a couple of modifications at the other end where we have a bus bar, but for the most part, we get to capitalize on everything that Tesla has engineered into that. Really excited about that. And uh, like I said, every once in a while you get lucky and we really scored in this case. Okay, so that's part of the power. That's the battery packs. Next onto is our gen set. So we've got a Cummins gen set. It's a four kilowatt gen set. A couple of things that we're kind of excited about. We don't know what kind of energy consumption this thing's gonna have cruising down the highway. Fortunate for us with our BMS, our VCU, and our dash, we're gonna be able to see exactly what it's consuming, real time, anytime. And then we'll be able to figure out how much range we can get out of adding this to the equation. And what's great about this is the, the actual overall footprint is substantially smaller than the engine package that we pulled out. So this is gonna sit right underneath the driver and passenger, right in the center of the vehicle, uh, above the transaxle, right where the original engine sat. Uh, we've got a frame roughed out for it. We used a, our, our, our cardboard cutouts um, as, as mock-up to fit that up underneath the chassis and to confirm fit, we fit. It fits great. What's really nice is that once the vehicle, the chassis is back down on the body with the gen, gen set in place, 
it's actually lower than the original engine package. So we have that big engine hump. We don't need that anymore. We'll probably leave it because it looks cool. Um, but if we want, we can actually pull that out. Uh, in our next episode, we're going to be talking about the interior and the dash and, and things that will be driver passenger centric. Um, right now, we're just talking about getting this thing moving. Uh, we're going to use the factory fuel cell, which is about 22 gallons, I believe, uh, which will keep this thing running for, for days on end. This just takes some of the anxiety and adds some of the fun to the program. Okay, so we've talked about the battery, we've talked about the motor and step down, and uh, you know, when a lot of people think about EVs, they think of them almost as RC cars. You got your battery, you got your motor, and you have some other little devices that make it go and turn. Uh, the EV conversion that we're doing and, and what people are doing out there now, there's a number of other devices included. Some of the reasons for those other devices are because of thermal management. There's a lot more energy being pushed to these battery factions through, through the motor, so there's actually cooling requirements. And then in addition to that, to have the rest of the vehicle that lives in a low voltage atmosphere, 12 volts, you have to step down from the pack voltage, which is 350, down to 12 volts DC. So you have a DC to DC converter. So you have these devices to handle that. And in addition to that, the onboard charger. So you can have your J plug, you can plug it in. So these are the devices that we had to, again, sort out. We're using the floor section of the passenger part of the, of the pin scour to add these devices. So walk over, I'll show you where we're gonna be mounting these. These are the two belly pans. And again, fortunate for us, they accommodate all those devices I just listed. That's a really nice bonus for us again, because limited fabrication required, really nice stout housing to protect everything. It's somewhat weatherproof, so we'll, we'll, we'll improve on that. So the rear belly pan section will actually accommodate a high density radiator and cooling fans and pumps. The VCU, JR, one of our engineers here, uh, lead of product development, coined a phrase, is the adult in the room. When we started with this project and we started in the EV realm, we noticed very quickly there's all these dif different devices in these different verticals and there was no adult in the room. There was no supervisor. It takes us back to the early days of tuning when AEM stepped in with the first plug and play engine management system. Prior to that, it was alphabet soup. You had all these different devices controlling all these different things. You had something for boost, something for fuel, something for timing. Then you had to work really hard to get them to work in symphony. The EV conversion world is very similar right now. They're isn't a product that is affordable or attainable for the, the average conversion facility or the high-end conversion facility or for EV motorsport conversion facilities. To give you an idea, the VCU 200, we're talking about a device that's right around $1,400 retail. In the EV world, in the EV realm, we've also realized a lot of the parts are very expensive. So it might be that the economies of scale aren't there yet, but it's also the fact that a lot of these devices are simply expensive to manufacture. We're showing up again, trying to make this available to everyone with the BCU 200. It's affordable, it's powerful. It gives you the ability to tie all these devices together so you can watch, you can listen, you can monitor, control all these other devices. And most of them by can. So it simplifies the wiring as well. In addition to things like you know, new springs and shocks, uh, we're, we're updating all that, but we're also having to update things like, you know, the CD boot. This was a little tired, so they're all four corners. Basically anything that's soft, fuel lines, brake lines, wheel cylinders, uh, that'll all get updated as well. One of the things, because this was an air-cooled engine, it didn't have a cooling system. What's required as a result of that is some fairly large high voltage lines that are going to be running throughout this vehicle, uh, and they have to be in a safe location. One of the safest locations is between the, 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 the actual chassis and the torque tube itself. The problem was that the vehicle, once backed down on its mounts, there's virtually no space. So you see these little pieces of two by four laying around. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna give this a little body lift. It's about an inch and three eighths body lift. And that gives us ample room to put channels down the center of the vehicle where we can drape or run all of our high voltage, low voltage, and cooling lines. So that makes it a little bit easier for us. Again, this might be a little bit of a cheat, but it's something that I think is, uh, it just makes sense for a conversion like this. So we're gonna leave it off right here. Really excited to share where we're at right now and hopefully you enjoyed what you saw. Next up is we're getting closer to the time we can push the button and start rolling with this. So uh, I did get pinged a few times on personal email that people wanted to see updates, updates, updates. So if you liked what you saw, hit like. If you wanna subscribe, subscribe. And please ring the bell so you are first in line for the next video out. So uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks. Yeah! Yeah! Holy Yay! Good job.